Welcome to Moxie Bets presented by Caesar Sportsbook. I'm your host, Katie Mox. Coming up on today's show, the college basketball conference tournaments are underway. We'll give you picks for some of the big ones. Plus, Selection Sunday is this weekend. We have a special guest to help you with those predictions. And we'll give some early leans on the NCAA tournament, as well as some possible bracket-busting underdogs to keep an eye on. But first, let's welcome in our guest, the Prime Minister of Degenerate Nation and the OG of the Action Network, Stucky. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Katie. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first, let's get into your background a little bit. I saw that you were the first content hire back in 2017, and you also helped launch the Action Network app, uh, which I love and use all the time. So tell me more about that. Yeah, I was in, <clears throat> was in, used to work in finance up until about Whoa. 20... 17 but i've always been active on forums twitter and i've uh, been betting for I don't know, every day since high school about 20 years now and i came and got, got to know a couple people that launched the yahoo sportacular app and they left yahoo to start the action network app and they wanted someone that could do content and they reached out to me and i decided to take a leap of faith and you know, know knowing or having a good feeling that betting was going to become legal. So I kind of left, yeah. you know, I had my master's in finance, CFA, I kind of just left it all and took a, a big gamble, my biggest gamble, so to speak. And uh, fortunately, <laughs> it worked out. And uh, here we are today. You know, whenever I talk to people in finance, they oh, and I try to explain sports betting to them, they're like, this sounds exactly like the stock market. Is that kind of how you see it too? Did you feel like your background just fit perfectly into sports betting, even though you said you've been doing it your whole life? Yeah. I mean, you're, if you're investing in the stock market, you're, you're kind of, I take a similar approach, right? You're trying to buy low, sell high, and it's kind of relevant going into the NCAA tournament and conference tournaments, which we'll talk about today is, okay, which stocks are kind of undervalued uh, from a futures perspective or just from a game by game perspective. So there's certainly a lot of parallels. Okay, before we get into uh, the NCAA tournament, I did say I looked at your Twitter and I saw your record for the NFL season. And I just have to give you your flowers. Sides, 57%, total 69%. Your two-team money line parlays, 10 and 1, almost 91%. Overall, 106-71 and 1, 59.9%. Only thing I feel like you kind of faltered on a little bit was the live uh, hedge. Do you, one, congratulations on a great season. That's phenomenal. Two, as far as like live betting or hedging, is that maybe something you'll stay away from a little bit more next season yeah i mean look it's one season i had a really good college football year too but like last year my i had a horrible college basketball season that's one of the benefits of you know if you use the action network app or you know any other tracking apps out there or if you just take an excel sheet which is what i used to do back in the day because you know sports yeah. but you could have a good month a good week a good season everyone's gonna have those you're gonna have bad weeks bad months bad seasons but how do you know if you really have an edge or if you're winning at this, but you have to track it. And there's a reason that a lot of, you know, sports books, you can't really see how you've done in the past. They don't want you to know that. So yeah, I mean, one season it's, it's nice, but um, I try to evaluate like 10,000 bets really is when you can have a, a good idea over the long run, how good or bad 10, you are at this over time. Um, that's like a, <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, it's, you got a, a couple of years sometimes it takes to really, weed out the variance and you have to, 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 how do you know if you're getting better or where your weak areas are? So yeah, that, that is, for example, that's one area of maybe opportunity that I'll look at in the off season, um, which is, you know, when I'll, I'll spend like April to you know June evaluating how I've done where potential growth areas could be, because you always have to adapt. And I, you, you could see it in the NCAA tournament when the lines come out after selection Sunday, the markets are always getting more efficient with each passing day and it's not going to get any easier. So you have to continue to yeah. adapt or you'll die out in this industry very quickly. Couldn't agree more. Okay, let's get now into Mox Thought. Stucky March Madness brackets can be fun, but frustrating. And just like vetting, there is no foolproof method. But what's your personal approach to March Madness in creating a bracket and especially just from a betting perspective in general for the tournament? Uh, ask my you know, little sister, my uncle, my mom, who have no idea what's going on. No, uh, there's, you know, filling out a bracket and trying to win a bracket pool is it's a lot of, it's a lot of luck. And sometimes the more, you know, yeah. you're, 
the harder it becomes. Um, but yeah, you don't want to have too many upsets and you don't want to have too much chalk. So you want to find yeah. you know, kind of that right balance and, you know, pick one or two, you know, potential, you know, Cinderella's and have them maybe making a run. You don't want to have them going too far. And then maybe a right. team in like the mid tier that you're really fond of making that run to the final four. So I think it's a matter of just finding that right balance between not too many upsets or not too few and then not too chalky, but you know, you have to have, you know, a lot of times the cream is going to rise to the top in these tournaments, especially the further you go along. So it's trying to find that right balance and then hoping that you, you get lucky. Do you start from the top? Like, do you do, you know, who's going to win in the final four first and then kind of build out from there? Or do you start from the outside and work your way up? Yeah, that's, I have like my, my horses and like, okay, who's going to win this region? Who am I very confident in? Where's, okay, what is the, you know, top one or two seeds that I'm very confident in? Where's like that four, five, six seed that I think mm -hmm. is going to make a run? And then, you know, okay, let me get to my final four. And then from there, I can determine, okay, which bracket am I least confident? Where do I think there's going to be chaos? And then that's kind of the bracket yeah. where, okay, I'm, you know, if there's a weaker, a more vulnerable, you know, one, two, three seed, that's when I might take a shot on, you know, a seven, eight, nine seed making a run to the final four. And this year in particular just feels as wide open as ever. And you can hear that all over, over the next week or two, but it's true. Like there's just, there's not an elite team or two, which we've seen in years yep. past. So yeah, the difference between like the one seeds and the four seeds this year, just from a power rating perspective, and then like the fours of the set, it's just not that much separation. So this year I might go with even more chaos than usual. More chaos than usual. Absolutely love to hear that. And I will say, I feel like I'm like not necessarily most Americans, but a lot of Americans where I don't pay too much attention to college basketball, especially, you know, until, until the NFL and everything is is over. And then it comes to March Madness. And all of a sudden I find myself in like five different bracket pools. And it always seems to be that my cousins who don't watch any sports and don't care are the ones that end up winning it all. So to your point, luck has a lot to do with it. And maybe you don't want to overthink it, but you certainly want to put some knowledge back there. Before we move on, I want to get your perspective on Gonzaga uh, this year. So they won four straight WCC tournament titles, making it their 24th straight trip to the big dance, tied for the third longest streak of all time. But this is the first time in two seasons that they don't enter the tournament atop the odds boards. Obviously, we know last year, you know, Zag tickets went up in flames in the Sweet 16. How do you feel about the Zags this year and their chances? not being a top seed. Yeah. I mean, they're certainly coming on at the right time and they have one of the best offenses in the entire country, which helps. And, you know, you have Drew Timmy and their guards are starting to play better. Uh, they, yeah, they're certainly a threat, uh, but I do have some concerns about their defense. You know, if you look historically over the past 20 years, if you, you know, go to Ken Palm and you add up the offensive adjusted efficiency, which is number, they're number one in, and then their defensive adjusted efficiency. There's only one exception where if you add those numbers up and they're at their, they add to more than 50. So you want to have a team that's, you know, a top 10 offense and maybe a top 30 defense. The only exception is 2014 UConn. That was it. And Gonzaga's yeah. adjusted That was a defensive, crazy run. Yeah, crazy run. Yeah. Gonzaga's defensive efficiency is at 74. So I worry a little bit about their defense. But as I said before, there's not really an elite team. Um, so yeah, that they, they're certainly dangerous and it feels like they're peaking at the right time, you know, ever since that, you know, they lost to St. Mary's and they lost to Loyal Mary, not at home, which was a, a pretty shocking loss. They rarely lose at home in conference play. And then you look at the second time. And then in the case of St. Mary's, the third time they played those teams, just a stark difference in how they're playing. They're using the press a little bit more, which has helped their defense. And, you know, you saw that against St. Mary's the past two meetings, they utilized the press, and then it just took a while for teams to get into their offensive sets and then kind of you know hid some of the issues that Gonzaga has defending, especially at the rim. So they're dangerous. Yeah. And if you're filling out a bracket, one thing that I should have mentioned is you can there's also some game theory involved as well. And you can take a look at, you know, there's there's gonna be, hey, look, ESPN has you know 80% of these people have this team winning it, or yeah. You know, 78% of people have this team in the final four. So if you want to stand out, which is what you need to do to try to win this bracket pool, then maybe in that region, go against the grain and say, 
You know, I'm going to have this team mm. that everyone has in the national championship. I'm going to have them losing in the Elite Eight, and I'm going to go with a different champion. Because a lot of times, if there is a unique, you know, a champion that not a lot of people have or final four, you want to get that final four right, or at least three of the four final fours or seven yeah. of the eight. So that's where you can kind of use game theory and go against the grain to kind of stand okay. out and then just hope that, you know, your team that you think is going to go down, that everyone thinks is going to win it all, you, you just root against yeah. them starting in the second round. That makes sense. I also think that maybe there's a little less pressure on Gonzaga this year since they aren't the top yep. seed. So maybe they'll not necessarily surprise people because they are still one of the best teams, but I feel like maybe they'll do a little bit better. Drew Timmy, I believe he just became the all-time leading scorer yep. for Gonzaga last night with his 18 points. How old is he? I feel like I've been watching him for a very long time. Yeah, he's he's up there. You're, you're seeing a lot of teams with these like grad students because of the COVID year that have mm. you know, they're 25. I think there's seven or I think seven or eight players that are 25 or older. Wow. And one of those, one team has three and that's Drake. Who's going to be, they're really scary. They're a team that could make a run okay. as little Cinderella here. They are extremely experienced. They're now fully healthy, well coached. Um, they can defend at a very high level. They're very versatile. They have a guard in Roman Penn, who I think is 26 now. He started Whew. for Siena. 26. In, yeah, he started for Siena in 2017, six years ago. He was starting for that Siena. That's insane. Yeah, so they're like grown men, very experienced. Um, uh -huh. And then if you saw the Missouri Valley Championship, they just absolutely obliterated Bradley. They're peaking at the right time. They're a team, they're probably going to be a 12 seed. They're a team that no five wants to see. If you see them on your bracket 12, depending on the matchup though, they're going to be a very yeah. popular and for a good reason, a very popular 12, five upset. You always see them every year. And I think they have a really good chance of getting to the second weekend. I mean, three people, 25 plus going against like 19 year olds. That is a yep. huge disparity. It kind of reminds me of like space jam with the tunes versus the aliens. Like that's yep. just a Absolutely. huge different there. And there is, I will say, um, and you can obviously confirm us the number 12 to the five seed. That's a, that's a typical upset spot, right? For these brackets. Yep. Yeah. And now that the markets are getting more efficient, you'll even see potentially a 12 seed favored over a five. Wow. Seed. Uh, one of, and one of my pet peeves is when you say, when announcers say there's an upset when really they were an underdog, but um, big right. difference <laughs> between the seeding uh, of a tournament and what the committee does. And then, you know, Vegas power ratings and people's power ratings and where the closing where the closing spread, uh, where the closing line spread, uh, finalizes, I should say. So, like, you could see a 12 yeah. this year, a, depending on the five. You could see a 12 favored over a five, and Drake certainly would be a candidate. Yeah, you talk about that UConn 2014 run. I believe that their odds were 95 to one uh, to win that tournament. So, uh, I, 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 you're not going to predict that that happens this year. But, man, if anybody had that in 2014, you are a rich, rich person. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a quick break. You're watching Moxie Bets, and we'll be right back. Spoiler alert, you're not going to win every bet that you place. But with Caesar Sportsbook, win or lose, every bet gives you reward credits and tier credits, which you can exchange for the best perks in the game. Hotel stays, VIP experiences, sports and concert tickets, and more. Download the Caesar Sportsbook app and start earning with Caesar's rewards. Time now for Capper's Corner. Let's welcome back in Stucky from the Action Network. Before we skip ahead to the NCAA tournament, let's talk some conference tournaments here. I definitely want to pick your brain, starting with the Big 12. That starts tonight. We take a look at the odds. you got Kansas as the favorite, plus 220. Texas plus 300. Then TCU, Baylor, Kansas State rounding out that top uh, a section there, plus 850. Who do you like to win this, and is there a good sleeper? Yeah, I like I went with TCU. They were eight to one a couple days ago. You could find them, I think, still plus seven fifty, plus seven hundred out there. Okay. They play Kansas State in the first matchup. And Kansas State's a team that was so good at home this year, but not the same team away from them. They split with TCU this season, but the game that they beat TCU, TCU star guard, Mike Miles, didn't play in that game. And I think overall it's a really good matchup for TCU. TCU wants to get out and transition, the best transition offense in all of college basketball. Kansas State's weak in that area. TCU is also a dominant offensive rebounding team. Kansas State's weak in that area. They can also turn Kansas State over. So I, I really like TCU in that first matchup. 
which means that I think they're going okay. to advance. And then they would face a Texas team that I think they also match up well with. Both of those games were excellent. I think that's close to a coin flip. And then the interesting part about this entire bracket is Kansas. One of the issues with Kansas that could rear its head this week is that they don't have any depth whatsoever. They basically go to Yesifu is like their sixth man. Sometimes he only plays like nine to 10 minutes, but they really ride their starting five, which in a tournament setting where you got to win three games in three days, if TCU then has to face Kansas in the championship, you know, the legs might not be there for Kansas. You even saw that towards the end of the season, Kansas, you know, they barely beat Texas Tech, barely beat West Virginia. Then they got blown out at Texas. So the legs might not be there for Kansas. And this is a TCU yeah. team that already went into Lawrence and just crushed the Jayhawks. So they've shown that they can do it in the state of Kansas. This will be an even easier setting. So I really like this TCU team. I really like them also in the NCAA tournament. They have, you know, they're an old experienced team, well coached, great guards, you know, two guards that flirted with the NBA draft, pulled out, came back and Damian Ball and Mike Miles, but they can really dominate on the offensive glass. So if they have an off shooting night, they're fine there. And if they play teams that allow them to get in transition, they're absolutely deadly there. So yeah, because I really like TCU in that first matchup, and then you have the Kansas depth issues, I like TCU to make a, a deep run here. Well, first of all, what a year for TCU. Their college program made it to the national championship game. You seem to think that they're going to do well uh, in the NCAA uh, tournament. To have both programs doing that well has got to be really big uh, for the school. And, you know, you said that you you think that they're going to do well in the NCAA tournament. And I did read a stat, and it's not that it never happens, but that it's very rare that someone wins the tournament that didn't also win their conference tournament. Yeah, usually, well, there's been some exceptions, but especially teams that lose in the first round or their first game mm. of the conference tournament, yep. you rarely ever see them win the national title. One exception is 20, 2019 Texas Tech, I think, lost early, and they didn't end up winning at all. They got to the the final. But I, I do believe in the history of the tournament, a team that lost their first game in the conference okay. tournament has never won the national title. So that could be something you take a look at after this weekend yes. as you're filling out your bracket. Okay, we love those tidbits. Okay, let's move on to the Big Ten. Uh, this one also starting tonight. You got Purdue as the favorite, plus 180. Indiana, plus 500. Michigan State, Maryland, Northwestern uh, at plus 1,000. Again, who do you like to win? And is there any kind of a sleeper or someone that you think could, could go a little bit farther? Yeah, Michigan's an intriguing team, you know, from a futures perspective. They're going to play Rutgers to start. And Rutgers, who lost, you know, their, their power forward is really important defensively. They lost him a couple weeks ago, and they've just not been the same team since. They also just can't score at all. So I like Michigan in that matchup, and then they'll get the one seed, Purdue, who I think they match up yeah. pretty well with. Michigan's been you – know, they played a, a number of overtime games lately. They're going to be in desperation mode. I think Purdue is a fairly vulnerable one seed. You know, Michigan has Dickinson with the, the matchup with Edie inside, and, uh, you know, I think their pick-and-roll offense can have some success here. So maybe Michigan's an intriguing – long shot because if they take out Purdue okay. then everything really opens up from a pricing perspective Northwestern just doesn't get any respect but 10 to yeah. 1 they have a double buy and then if you look at the bottom half of the bracket Indiana who has a great path on paper and everyone loves Indiana you know they're I think four or five to one they have to win the same amount of games as Northwestern if they both win their first game they would face each other in the semifinals, Northwestern swept them during the regular season. They can really defend the post well, which is why they've had a lot of success during Big Ten play. And their guards, I think, have a pretty distinct advantage on the outside against Indiana's perimeter D, which can be a little shaky at times. So just from a, a pricing perspective, Northwestern, they get the double buy and you get them 10 to 1. Uh, and then, you know, if the chalk holds, they play a team they swept during the regular season. So they're certainly intriguing. And it was a conference that was dominated by the home teams. Like home teams just couldn't lose on their home floor all season during Big Ten play. The team that's, you know, doesn't get hurt as much as others is Northwestern, right? They don't have a great home court advantage. So, you know, playing on it, you know, they're playing in Chicago close to home. But I assume other schools are going to have just as big, if not bigger fan bases there. So, yeah, Northwestern yeah. just not getting a lot of respect with the double buy and the price that they're at. So they're definitely worth a look. 
I think because maybe Northwestern hasn't been very good in recent years, so people just kind yeah. of overlook them. But yeah, 10 to 1, hard to argue with that, worth a little sprinkle. How much does coaching go into this? Because you got to think Izzo's got to be, now that Coach K is gone, one of the longest standing coaches in college so far, certainly well experienced for these conference tournaments and the NCAA tournament. Do you look at coaching as well uh, when you're looking at these matchups? Yeah, I think coaching is, is massive, especially in, in a tournament setting when you have quick turnarounds, right? And like in that Thursday to Saturday in the NCAA tournament, and even more so in conference tournaments, which you only have one day to prepare. So it could be a team that you yeah. face during the regular season a couple of times. What adjustments can you make from those prior meetings? And the the coat the elite coaches who can, you know, implement a game plan, implement adjustments on, you know, within 24 hours, sometimes less than that, I think have a distinct advantage. So yeah, definitely look at coaching. And then, you know, on the, on the same side of the token, it's matchups as well. Okay, this team's very heavy pick and roll. How is this team defending the pick yeah. and roll? But a lot of times it just comes down to these little adjustments so between these teams that are familiar with each other. And all of that is coaching on a quick turnaround. Okay, let's let's move to the SEC now. You got Bama plus one sixty, and then you got Kentucky plus three eighty. Tennessee, Texas A and M, Arkansas is at plus a thousand. Who do you think is taking the SEC this year? Bama, the pretty heavy favorite. Yeah, if you look at Bama's rightfully the favorite here. They've been the best team in the league all year. They have a pretty favorable path too. If you look, I mean Tennessee mm -hmm. lost to guys Zeg Ziegler. They're, he's really important, especially just implementing their offense. So they're missing him. Florida lost their big man, Colin Castleton. Yeah. You know, so the, the top half is very easy. It looks like Alabama is going to get to the final, but at a price of plus 160, no real value there, probably priced correctly, if not a little overvalued. Yeah. So, but the bottom half is a little more intriguing to me. You know, if you can find a, I, I, I took a little 13 to one on Arkansas. They'll play Auburn okay. in their first game. I like the matchup for them. And then, you know, if they win that game, they would play Texas A&M. They split during the regular season. It's It should be a rock fight, just just an all-out brawl, that particular matchup. And then on the bottom half, you have Kentucky dealing with some injuries. They've also been inconsistent. And they've struggled with Vanderbilt at times. I know Vanderbilt yeah. lost their big man, Liam Robbins. But even without him, they recently won in Lexington. So I think the bottom half's pretty open. And Arkansas, they just haven't been able to put it all together, but they have a ton of talent. They have three potential first-round draft picks. So, you know, in a conference tournament setting, can you get hot? Arkansas certainly has the talent to do so. I don't mind the path. So I like buying on the upside of Arkansas, who can put it together for a weekend. They also did win at Kentucky in pretty convincing fashion. So I think Arkansas is the team that I'm targeting on the bottom half of that bracket, which I think is a little more wide open. What do you think is going on in Kentucky? Because I feel like the last few years, uh, you know, they're one of those blue bloods that you always expect to do well in the NCAA tournament. But the last few years, they've been wildly inconsistent and pretty up and down. What do you think has been going on in the bluegrass state? Yeah, well, that's this is my my hometown. I'm in, in I live in Lexington, um, very close okay. to the program. It's you I mean, know more than anybody else. <laughs> yeah, the coach Cal. It's you know he's a great recruiter, a great players coach, but he's not the best X's and O's coach as far mm. as like in game adjustments and they you know some of the the schemes that they run are outdated and so I think a little bit is coaching. Some of it is just mm -hmm. uh, they've been unlucky, right? It's a, it's the NCAA tournament. You're going to yeah. get in. Sometimes you're going to get upset, and they haven't won a game in a couple of years. They're also trying to transition into, okay, we're getting transfers now. It used to be, hey, let's get the most talented freshmen. We have five freshmen in here that are five stars, and then we're peaking as we head into March. So it's been a little bit of a different flavor for Kentucky recently. I will say they have a ton of talent. They seem to be yeah. peaking at the right time. They're a team that's going to be very difficult to figure out in the bracket, maybe a five, mm -hmm. six seed. You could, they're one of those teams okay. you could have going to the final four, or you could have them losing in the yeah. second round. I wouldn't be shocked at either of those results. I, I'm not looking forward to the region that they're in because I'm going to have no idea what to do yeah. with the Cats.
Uh, so now let's talk about, I think this is my favorite um, tournament right now, the Big East. This one feels wide open. You got UConn plus 230, Creighton plus 230, Marquette plus 330. Then you got, then you got Xavier and Villanova. But this seems like the tightest um, of all of the tournaments. What are you feeling for this one? Yeah, I tend to like, I think I like UConn, which is chalky. I don't see a ton of value in their number, but there's an analytical site, uh, Torvik, Bart Torvik runs it. And you can look over the past month. Over the past okay. month, you could filter out. UConn has been the number one team in the country in overall adjusted efficiency. They're peaking at the right Ooh. time. I think they match up well with Providence. They match up well with Marquette. So I think that they're going to take down this tournament, but I don't really love their price. Providence has been yeah. fading lately, but they have a buy. Yeah. And, you know, just if they can get up for one game, and beat UConn, then you're going to be sitting with a pretty ticket in your pocket. I will say Villanova, who's, you know, they got Justin Moore back. He's important, especially on the defensive end. He's another facilitator on their offense. They were struggling without him since he returned and kind of got assimilated into the offense. They've been playing a lot better. They're kind of everyone's potential darling in this tournament, mm. but eight to one. I mean, look, they're going to, their path is extremely difficult and they're going to start with Georgetown tonight, which they'll probably win. But then you're going to face most likely three of the best teams in the league. If you just had a money line rollover, so if you took you know 100 bucks, whatever your unit is, put it on Villanova money line tonight, took that, what you won, plus your original bet, and then just kept rolling it over, you're going to get much better odds than 8-1. to one. There's just no value in 8-1 to one for them having to win four games in four days. So. If you like Villanova, go with a money line roller, which sometimes makes more sense in these okay. conference tournament settings. But I, I think UConn's playing so well right now. I like their path, the matchups that they have. So I'm probably staying away from the Big East in general. But you're right. It does feel pretty wide open. It should be a fun tournament as usual. Absolutely. And it's here at uh, MSG, uh, which is always a, a, a fun building uh, to play in for these kids. And it's interesting, UConn obviously has had some incredible runs in the past. We talked about 2014 and then, of course, the, the Kemba Walker year. But uh, it's it's the Lady Huskies that usually get, I feel like, a lot of the uh, fanfare and accolades uh, for basketball. Yep. Yeah, they. I think they just beat, speaking of Villanova, they just beat Villanova but didn't cover. I think they were 14-point favorites. But yeah, they'll they'll be in the mix again, and yeah, what a it did, look. UConn is back. The men's are, I think, trending back. They kind of fell off for a little bit, so yeah, it's a good time yeah. to be a UConn Huskies fan for sure. All right, let's go West Coast Pac-12. This one starts this afternoon. You got UCLA and Arizona at the top. UCLA plus one forty, Arizona plus one eighty. Then you go down to USC plus six hundred, Oregon nine to one. You know, UCLA, obviously the clear favorite here, but the Wildcats are super close. What do you think? Yeah, there's if you want to take a, a long shot in this league, maybe look at Washington State. I think you can find them okay. I think like 20, 22 to one ish. I'm saying, yeah, Ooh. I think you can still get them 22 to one super experienced team. And you know, they won at Arizona. They lost to UCLA by one. They're now healthy. So. That's one of the things I also look for is, okay, is a team maybe undervalued because they dealt with injuries during the regular mm -hmm. season, which certainly applies to Washington State. And then another thing that I look for with these long shots is, okay, does the team play really slow? And can they hit, do they take a lot of threes and hit a lot of threes? And the reason, and that's the case with Washington State, the reason that's what I look for is that, if, okay, if you're slowing the game down, fewer possessions, higher variance. And then if you take a lot of threes and, it helps if you can make them again, more variance. So if this is a team that just, if they get hot from three, they have a lot of shooters. They have uh Mo Gee is just, a, they run their offense through him. A big man who's played his best games against the best competition in the pack 12. He's a really special talent. I love their coach. So I think that, you know, they're a team definitely worth exploring UCLA also dealing with a key injury. So yeah, I think mm. that this is the pack 12 we've seen in the past, some crazy runs by lower seeds. Oregon State yeah. recently. So, uh, yeah, I took a little a shot with uh, Washington State and hoping for some chaos, chaos out west. 22 to 1. That's, uh, that's always a, a really fun one to make. Okay, let's look at Mountain West. Uh, also starting this afternoon, a lot of them starting today. San Diego plus 150. Utah plus 320. Then you got Boise State and Nevada. Uh, what do you think in here? 
Yeah, pretty. I think it's pretty wide open. San Diego State's clearly the best team in the favor, but I don't really yeah. see any value with them. They find themselves sometimes in these like low scoring grinders, which you yeah. know they just have an off shooting night. Matt Bradley in particular has an off shooting night. They could certainly get upset. So, you know, and there's another thing worth noting here and something that you want to look at. I mentioned this with Kansas, but depth. Teams with lack of depth, you know, having to win mm. three or four games in four days could really end up costing them, especially if they get to the final or they get to the semis. That's the case, especially Boise State has absolutely no bench whatsoever, which I think mm -hmm. is going to really hurt them here. So I think the bottom half of the bracket is where I'm looking to attack. A team that plays today, New Mexico, I think you could find them 13 to 1. They have the guards that can make a run in House and Mashburn Jr. House was out for a couple of games. They kind of faded down the stretch. They were almost a lock for an at-large maybe a month ago. Now, I think they need to win this tournament to get in, but they're certainly an intriguing long shot and I think a pretty wide open conference. You also could look at UNLV playing at home. They also dealt with some injuries during the regular season, but you know, March, a lot of it is about the guards. New Mexico certainly has the guards that if they can get hot, they can carry them to a title here. I love what you said about death because I feel like so many people look at the flashy players on a team or maybe how many points they score. But yeah, when you're having games every single day like this, or even, if, you know, if I go to the, the NBA, the Warriors, why they've been so successful in the postseason is because of their depth. If you don't have a bench, you don't have anything. So definitely uh, love that and something to look into when you're doing your brackets moving forward. Now for the ACC, uh, this, I mean, the consensus, obviously, Houston, minus three. 10. Nobody's taking that better. If you are, you're a bit of a chump here. Memphis plus 400, Cincinnati plus 1200. It's, I mean, it's obviously that Houston is going to win this, but is it even worth sprinkling on somebody else? Yeah. I mean, Houston in the top half is a pretty easy path to the championship game. But if they do get there in the chalk holds, Memphis has given them a ton of issues. They match up really well. Just their athleticism okay. can give Houston a ton of issues. If you look back over the past four seasons, Memphis is actually 7-0 and against the spread when they face Houston. If that's the matchup again, I'll probably be looking to bet Memphis again, who just lost at the buzzer at home against Houston. And then they played Houston tough early this season at Houston, even without their starting point guard. But Memphis has a couple potential landmines in the bottom half of the bracket. One, Tulane. Tulane swept them this season but Tulane you okay. mentioned lack of depth they they don't have any depth whatsoever and I think they've really just been losing their legs they've been fading down the stretch a team that's more interesting to me is UCF which you could have found them Ooh. maybe 40 to 1 out there oh. um okay. UCF so UCF beat Memphis at home and then at Memphis they lost by one but this is a team that dealt with some injuries during the season. Their point guard, Darius Johnson, was out for a long stretch. I think that really hurt some of their metrics. But they match up pretty well with Memphis. They also have a potential first-round draft pick in Hendricks, who's just a special freshman. They have a lot of talent on that team. And this is there's certain teams that just, okay, look, we had a disappointing year, but then you get to the conference tournament, and it's kind of a reset button. I think they're one of those teams that could benefit the most from, okay, new life here, let's make a run. And, you know, they win the first game, which they should. They would play Memphis, should be a close game. And then they also played Houston fairly tough both meetings. So, yeah, I think that there's some mm. value on the Knights, given the amount of talent that they have, some of the injuries that they dealt with during the season. And, yeah, if they can win that Memphis game, you have a pretty valuable ticket. Wow, you got a 22 to 1 and now a 40 to 1, giving a lot of value here today, Stucky. Okay, so let's move on to Selection Sunday. Uh, I mean, if we talk about automatic bigs, you got Gonzaga, Oral Roberts, Northern Kentucky, Charleston, Fairleigh Dickinson, uh, Southeast Missouri State, Drake, UNC Asheville, and uh, Louisiana, Furman, et cetera. Any predictions for Selection Sunday? Are there some bubble teams that really need to perform in their respective conference tournaments in order to make the big dance? Yeah, there's going to be a couple that will play over them. a couple tonight. NC State, I think, is right on the bubble. They'll play Virginia Tech tonight. I think they got to have that game. Penn State 
I think is right on the bubble. They'll play Illinois. Rutgers, I think, is trending in the wrong direction. If they lose to Michigan, Oof. I think they're in trouble. Wisconsin, I think, is in a must-win game against Ohio State tonight. Yeah. Um, and then, let's see, Nevada potentially, Oklahoma State against Oklahoma. And again, that's a coin flip. I think Oklahoma State needs to win tonight. So, yeah, I think tonight, if you're a bubble team, well, Oklahoma State yeah. is one to keep an eye on. You know, Tomorrow, Rutgers, Wisconsin tonight as well. I think some of these teams, they lose their first game. They're on the wrong side of the bubble and they're out. Oh, a lot of pressure tonight. Okay, so if you had to pick right now, and of course it is way too early because we haven't even had Selection Sunday, but you know who the automatic bids are. Who do you like winning the whole shebang? Well, I'm going to go out on a limb. Before the season, my only future that I bet was TCU. So I'm sticking, I'm, I stick okay. to my guns. I'm, I'm yeah. saying TCU. Uh, this is a team, their, their analytical profile is, you know, they're still like ranked around like the 20th, 22nd best team but they dealt with injuries to their guards they dealt with injuries in the front post but they're now almost fully healthy we'll see eddie lampkin one of their important forwards but they've built some depth because of the injuries that they dealt mm. with but they have everything that i look for it's elite guard play they can defend they're very versatile well coached uh experienced and then if they have an off shooting night they're one of the best offensive rebounding teams in the country. So I really like TCU to make a deep run. We've seen the big 12 the past two years, have a, obviously have a ton of success winning back-to-back -back titles. I think the big 12 is the best league in the nation by far. These teams are battle tested every night. I mean, Oklahoma is the last place team in that league. I mean, they were on the bubble about a month ago. They're yeah. uh, basically a pick against Oklahoma state. I mean, that league is deep. Those teams are tested on a yeah. nightly basis and yeah, so I'm going to stick to my guns with TCU. If you're looking for something a little chalkier, I think UCLA is very, very dangerous. I don't see them getting yeah. upset early. They're going to make a deep run. They have those two very reliable seniors, well-coached, experienced. They do everything well. And UConn, I think, is peaking at the right time. Inside-out game. They have the bigs that really can rebound and give teams trouble, matchup nightmare. So those are two of the chalkier teams that I like, but – I got to stick to my guns before the year. I said it's TCU and uh, I'm going to start my bracket yeah. by putting TCU as my chance. TCU, the Horn Frogs. Again, what a, what a year for both of those programs. All right. So who is this year's Cinderella? Who is the St. Peter's Peacocks you think of 2023? Uh, I'm going to say, well, the other teams that you just mentioned that are in, well, Or mm -hmm. Roberts is going to be dangerous. I mean, Max A. Smith, yeah. we've seen him make a run before, and their defense is even better than that team that made a run a couple years ago. They're dangerous. No one's going to want to see them. A. Smith's capable of going for 40. Charleston is a team that just comes at you in waves. They can shoot the three. They have a ton of guys that can just get hot from three, which always makes them dangerous. They want to play super up-tempo, and they just keep coming at you. I really love their coach as well. But I'm going to say Drake, just with that experience factor, mm. their versatility on defense. Well, they they got the big the, guys, right? They got the three 25-year-olds yeah. and one 26-year-old, yep. you said? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're men, and they are not going to yeah. be an easy <laughs> out. They've, they've been through wars before. So I'm going to say Drake makes a deep run in the, the bracket. Okay, I actually love that. And honestly, last year I had so much fun with St. Peter's. I actually won a lot of money on them because I was just riding the wave, mostly just for fun. But, you know, obviously the everybody knows that there's going to be back at, uh, bracket busters and everyone knows that there's going to be an upset. But do you find it really fun, you know, when a team is unlikely as the Peacocks make it really far or do you find it frustrating and annoying? No, I love it. Uh, well, that St. Yeah. Peter's, no, my... Wife has two bars here <laughs> in Lexington and right near okay. Rupp, they're college bars. So yeah, obviously oh, Kentucky, Kentucky advancing yeah. in the tournament would have been yeah. very nice for her. I had a couple kids that came to visit me. They drove from North Carolina on that Thursday night and they were like, we want to experience a Kentucky game out at the bars on a Saturday night. Oh. By the time they got here, Kentucky had already lost. And the Saturday night game, instead of Kentucky, it was uh, Murray State versus St. Peter's. It was raining. The bars were empty. Yeah. It was it was awful. But other than that oh. specific example, I yeah, you have to love the underdog. There comes a point where maybe they go a little too far, and you know they get to the mm -hmm. elite eight or final four, and then you know blow out yeah. when they're overmatched. But 
Yeah, you go back to George Mason, their amazing run. I think it's the 10-year anniversary of the most fun Cinderella we will ever see, I think, in in Dunk City, Florida Gulf Coast. I mean, just throwing alley-oops all over and beating high major teams. That was as fun as it gets. So yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's what March is all about. Finding these teams like St. Right. Peter's. The who, chaos. Yeah. They had to like, they couldn't even afford to send their cheerleaders at one point. They had to come up with the money to do it. They play in these <laughs> oh. tiny gyms and yeah, that's what, that's what March yeah. is all about. Uh, I live for that. So yeah. I, and th- this year's wide open. I think that we're going to get at least one team that just shocks the world and blows up every bracket. Um, and if you can pick that one, you're going to be in, in pretty good shape. So yeah, uh, I'm going with Drake. I'm going. Yeah. I'm going with the men on this one. I'm writing that with you. And I, I will say, I have a couple really good girlfriends from Kentucky. I don't know if you know where Katie's Kentucky is. Very very small town, but they um, all went to University of Kentucky as well. And I remember they were very upset uh, when the Peacocks won. But I was like, at least they went really far. At least it wasn't just like because at that point the team is kind of legit, at least in the tournament. So that makes you feel slightly better about the loss than if they just beat Kentucky and then lost. Yeah, and then they, they beat Purdue. People forget some... that. They beat yeah. Purdue. Purdue got off the yeah. hook because it's like everyone remembers that St. Peter's beat Kentucky. But, yeah, it does kind of validate it a bit that they made a run and yeah, what a hell of a run by St. Peter's. Well, first, the fact that your wife owns bars, I'm not going to let that slide. Tell me more about your wife and the bars in uh, Lexington. That's so cool. Yeah, she's a minority owner and GM of both of uh, Stagger Inn and Two Keys Tavern. It's one of them's. To, uh, stagger and it's kind of like a it's a kind of a country bar but it's a sports bar they'll have like country covers cool. on the weekend um and then two keys is just a pure college bar outdoor indoor and then there's kind of like a clubby thing attached to it but yeah when kentucky is playing in the tournament this is uh, it's all anyone cares about in the entire state and people don't realize yes. it's there's no pro team the football team has been better lately but usually historically has been bad and it's all Kentucky basketball. So you take the entire state and, you know, in Louisville, you have your Louisville fans, even some people yeah. in Louisville are Kentucky fans outside of Louisville. And then especially in Lexington, all anyone really cares about is the college basketball team. So when right. they make a run, which they haven't in forever in the tournament, but I've seen videos. I didn't live here back in, you know, 2011, 12, back, and then way back. I mean, it is awesome. Um, I was here in, 2017 2017 or 2018 when luke may hit the buzzer beater for north carolina in the elite Oof. that was devastating it went from kentucky tied on a three there i mean uh, there's news cameras there it was it just, and then everyone is going crazy and then luke may has a shot and it was just complete silence and it was awful but yeah it's an exciting time here um they, for the games it'll it just it feels like vegas down downtown when yeah. kentucky's playing like everyone is just out drinking no one like even works um so hopefully for the <laughs> sake of their known. bars and the city it's just uh kentucky can make a run yeah, especially after last year because that was uh very disappointing to go out in the first round to st peter's but yeah it's fun if you're ever in lexington um reach out to me i'm always happy to buy people drinks and watch some sweat some games yeah. are you from kentucky originally no, I'm from outside of Philly, uh, suburbs of Philly. Okay. Went to school in D.C., um, so I've always been on the East Coast, but moved down here, which is where my wife was from. When I so when I started, we well, helped start Action Network. I really could work from anywhere, and anywhere. like I, I'm a little older than my wife, and then so my group of friends back home were, you know, getting married, having kids, and I wasn't at that point. When I, whenever I came down here to visit right. her in the bars, I developed like a good group of friends and she's like petrified of flying seamless. so it was just very Ooh. easy and she also works of like her bars are here so it just made sense for me to move down here and uh i love it here um so yeah i'm uh in lexington for the time being who knows where we'll be in the future but been here for five years love it and would like to see one run while well, maybe i'm the curse since i've been yes. here they just they can't seem to make a run but hopefully this speaking, is the year speaking of curses what do you think of the drake curse because i know that he is a big kentucky fan and uh, a lot of people like to say that he is a curse especially when he bets on a team yeah well i hopefully he's not wearing kentucky gear this year because yeah, there, there <laughs> seems to be something to that um yeah, yeah. so that's that's a good point i'm going to blame drake and not myself 
Yeah, not you. It's not you. It's Drake. It's totally Drake. All right, Stucky, thank you so much for joining the show today and dropping so much knowledge on the conference tournaments and the NCAA tournament coming up. You can find the Prime Minister of Degenerate Nation either at his wife's bars in Lexington or his Twitter handle at Stucky2. You can also find him written video and in podcast form on the Action Network podcast and Action Network. Dot com. Stucky, again, thank you so much. This has been Moxie Vets presented by Caesar Sportsbook. Don't forget to follow us on social at Moxie Vets. <laughs>